The European Union is digging in over its proposed new tariffs on Chinese EV imports. The competition commissioner, Margaret Vestea, telling CNA they are justified and fair. Now, this as China ups the ante in the budding trade war, announcing next steps in its investigation into European brandy imports. It will hold a hearing this month on the probe that involves claims the EU is exporting brandy at prices below market rates. Since January, Beijing has opened tit-for-tat probes into European brandy and pork imports. They strike predominantly at French, Spanish, Dutch and Danish commercial interests as the 27-strong bloc wavers over whether to back the Commission in an upcoming advisory vote on the EV tariffs. Even as tensions ratchet up, China's Commerce Ministry said it is still hoping to reach a consensus on the EV levies with the EU through dialogue. But even amid talk of dialogue, the EU is unmoved in its position that a level playing field in electric vehicles is important for the world. In a CNA TV exclusive, Lokwe Su talked to Margaret Vestea executive vice president of the European Commission about her organization's antitrust brief over big tech and about the planned tariff increases on Chinese EVs. So these are not tariffs that will do away with the competitive edge of Chinese competitors towards European competitors. It will correct uh, what we consider by WTOs to do, be the unfair part of it. And, and I think it is necessary because it is important that you have a global uh, EV uh, industry, uh, that it's not just China providing uh, for the entire world. No less than uh, Joseph Burrell, so it's a foreign policy chief of the EU, would say this is an internal, a problem that is part of the Chinese economy. It's a structural imbalance that is specific and inherent in the Chinese economy, tariffs alone hardly a start to fix this case. Well, even if there's not one silver bullet, uh, one should not sort of say, then we will not use it. I think it's fully appropriate uh, by following international rules also to use the terrorist instrument because the terrorist tells you that something is wrong. As said, with these tariffs of 20 and 40 percent, there will still be imports of e-vehicles from China to Europe. This is not a blockage, this is still global trade ongoing. But of course there is a more long-lasting question about internal demand in China, what happens if internal demand in China is subdued, where does then capacity go for that reason. But that is also a Chinese problem, just as well as it shows its effects in the European market. So even though there is a bigger question at stake here, uh, I think tariffs are justified as long as they follow international rules. So how would you go further to manage what you yourself have called the Chinese playbook, which has essentially eviscerated the EU's solar industry and possibly has a chance of doing that to your wind turbine industry as well? What we see as a, as a playbook uh, is what we saw with solar uh, panels. So give or take 15 years ago, uh, European businesses were invited to China for JVs. Uh, there was a technology transfer. There were subsidies to production to be set up in China. Slowly but surely, import to China was closed off, capacity built off on the subsidized production facilities. Now massive exports coming from China with a very attractive price point, primarily, but not only because of the subsidies given, but also because of comparable wages, uh, now technology mastership. And the result is that I think last year, give or take only 3% of installed capacity of solar panels in Europe was actually produced in Europe. So we have now put in place uh, an action plan for wind not in order not to have competition from China, but to make sure that also European wind industry can continue to compete on fair conditions.
So there are a number of elements uh, of this plan. One of them is, of course, to use the tool that we now have, which is a tool that allows us to go investigate if we find that in public tenders, for instance, for wind uh, capacity. The foreign subsidies regulation gives us this instrument to look for foreign subsidies. We have a big investigation in wind, just as well as we had opened one in uh, trains previously. For instance, when we opened on the train bit in Bulgaria, the Chinese bidder actually withdrew from that tender, so we couldn't proceed with the investigation. I'm moving on to something that has been making the headlines, the Digital Markets Act, mm -hmm. Digital Services Act, using this new toolbox to take on big tech. It's in their interest to prefer themselves. It's in their interest to feed their own. Why would they change their business model? Well, both the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act comes after years either of voluntary codes of conduct or individual competition cases. And what we have learned is that this is not enough. This does not produce, uh, I think, actually quite simple results that we're asking for. That digital services are safe to use, that what is illegal offline is also treated and respected as illegal uh, online, and that the market is open and contestable. I think these are absolutely legitimate asks in an open uh, market economy as, as the one we have. Uh, the benefit of the Digital Markets Act is that we do not have first to prove market dominance. That is the entry point for our competition tools that a company is dominant. That takes quite a lot of time. Now we have designated the gatekeepers already. They got a label on their shoulder. So we know what obligations they have, what prohibitions they're up against. And we have a even more forceful toolbox. So high fines that can be double fines that can lead to uh, orders of divestiture uh, in, in repeated uh, instances if changes are not actually happening. And I think the reasons why we now have uh, six non-compliance cases, uh, we have already stated our preliminary findings in, in two of them, is that we actually do get closer to the business model. And the ask is not for the businesses to be smaller business or, or to shrink. It is to make sure that the market is open and contestable. Because these days, you cannot make sure that based on your business idea, your work ethic, the capital you have on board, that it is you who have a fair chance of reaching your customers. You will still depend on a gatekeeper for that to happen. And that is not a fair and contestable dynamic market as we see it. You've said this, legislation changes perception, implementation actually changes behavior. If 8.2 billion euros does not check Google, and if the European Commission is not prepared to go for the nuclear option, that's one of them of actually breaking up a company, where does implementation lie? Well, I think two things have happened over the years. Uh, first, I think the perception of big tech has changed. When I came into this job 10 years ago, they could do nothing wrong. That was basically the approach when I took up the first Google case. That has changed dramatically. Now we have a different level of enforcement in a number of other jurisdictions. We have the same asks of big tech to be sure that the market is open and contestable and that others can, can go against them. And the second thing is that now, sort of the, uh, the divestiture, the breakup option is much more present uh, than it was because we have sort of speeded up uh, our enforcement uh, actions. We can focus on the implementation and we can get there much, much faster. And this is very much a, a question of speed because companies very often, they just uh, play for us being slower. Tech, you said when you first, years ago, it could do nothing wrong. Now, it challenges, and I quote you, democracy challenges humanity, challenges our very security. How do we manage it? Final question. Well, we manage as a world community. What I see now when countries are coming together, 
to play a role in saying, listen, when it comes to AI, we see all the promises, we see all the use cases, but we need to get in control of the dark sides because as humanity, we need to make sure that technology is serving humans. This is not for the Europeans alone. This is not for us with the Americans. This is not for us with the Canadians. This is for everyone to come on board. And I think one of the promising things are the AI summits that are ongoing. It's the Hiroshima process uh, led by the Japanese. It's the UN uh, summit of the future that will have a very strong component of this. The only way humanity uh, can cope is actually by coming together.